don't sacrifice in my family line, well, the next generation will have to fight battles I was designed to do. So sacrifice is selfless. Sacrifice has the ability to say, I'm doing this. I'm, I'm, it's scary and it's sacred because I want the next generation to live well. They'll have to sacrifice their own stuff. What's the sacrifice I need to make for my generation? Let's go to the next slide. John 12, 24 says, Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, not when it dies, if it dies, if it dies, it means there's a, there's a choice here. I have to intentionally sow the seed. It's not going to happen just because. Oh, it'll happen when it happens. No, no, no. In order to produce many seeds, I have to intentionally put it in the ground if it dies. And I want to say today that by the end, we're going to be praying and there are going to be things that you've carried for years that are inferior to your divine design that are going to die at this altar today and make room for the God seed inside of you if it dies. You cannot sacrifice by accident. No, you can't. Like, I look at the production team and, and, and the teams that serve. You don't, you don't go, I accidentally turned up at church at 5.30 in the morning to make things happen. I don't accidentally turn up and greet at the door. I don't accidentally sacrifice. I can throw things out accidentally. But I can't say I sacrificed accidentally. Like my family and I, we're like the kind of people that go on holidays and, you know, we, we, we stay by the beach, but we swim in the pool. You know what I mean? Like, cause, and the pool has to overlook the beach. But, but I, I, don't wanna, I don't always go to the beach. And I, I mean, I, I don't mind the beach, but it's just not as efficient because it takes so much time to get the sand out of everywhere. So, so, so we swim in the pool, go to the beach, but every now and then we go to the beach and We've got all the stuff and the kids want to go and that's, and that's fine. And I'm a pretty decent swimmer. I will say I'm a, I'm a pretty decent swimmer. But I grew up in the era of Jaws, right? So I make sure there's at least a few people a bit further out than me because Jaws has to have some options, right? But we, we, we were at the beach and we came home and, of course, you put all your beach stuff in a good plastic bag because you can wash it out then. So we put it in a plastic bag and we, cut, we get home and we're unpacking. And so I put it in the laundry right next to the door, right next to the, uh, the, the, the washing machine and everything else. And so it's out there. And, and the next morning I wake up and Ali goes, oh, it's bin day today. Have you gone out to the, have you done the bins? And of course, as I'm running down the stairs, I go, yeah. And so I run down, I pick up all the bags near the rubbish bins and everything and walk out the laundry door. Happen, and I happen to pick up the bag full of swimming stuff. Now there's slides in there, swimmers in there, goggles in there, anything that you could have thought, flippers in there, there was just everything. But it was a plastic bag that we tied up. So I pick up everything, throw it in the bin with the four bags that I had, but one of the bags is all the swimming stuff. So I then chuck it in the bin. Now, about a month later, about a month later, we're all like, you know what? Let's go visit my cousin down the Gold Coast. We'll take our swimming stuff with us. So my whole family is on a scavenger hunt. <laughs> Dad, where did these go? Mom, where's our swimmers? It should have been right here. And we're thinking, and we would have looked around the house with half an hour, 45 minutes easy. Because we, we checked the car. We checked the laundry. We checked the cupboards. We checked everywhere until I had this thought wait a minute and you know when you're a dad and you don't want to admit that you did something stupid and I threw it out and I had to I, and I had to admit with humility to my family that I threw out all of their stuff and swimmers and slides and everything now here's what I couldn't say I just sacrificed it unto the Lord like, God bless me with more swimmers and stuff because I, I, I sacrificed it. No, no that's, I threw it out. I lost it. It was accidental. I didn't sow my swimmers into the ecosystem, right? Everything we do when it comes to seed 
has to be intentional. I make a choice to sacrifice. So if we go back to John 12, if you bring that up, it produces many seeds if it dies. Let's go to the next slide. And that's because sacrifice is sacred. It's set apart. It's holy. Let's never become familiar with that which is holy and sacred. Never become familiar with the Holy Spirit being in your life all the time. Never become familiar with communion and go, well, it's just part of the run sheet. It's not. It's not. It's this moment where you get to say, I'm part of God's story to bring healing to the whole world. Sacrifice is sacred. Let's go to the next slide. Genesis 3.15, and I'll put enmity, but open hostility between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He will crush your head and you shall only strike his heel. This is God speaking to the serpent. And watch this. The, the, the salvation and redemption story for the whole world outside of time was built with a seed narrative. Like God's best idea to bring healing and wholeness to the whole world was, I'm going to do it in seed form. We fight because we don't always like seed ideas. We like outcomes. We like finished product ideas. And every so often we are so consumed with dreaming about an outcome that we've just forgotten how to steward seed well. And I'm all for vision. It's kind of what I do in life. But I have to look at what seeds I have in front of me. What seed has God given me? So God's idea from the beginning. So he's speaking to the serpent and he's talking about the messianic promise of seed, which Mary then writes a worship song about. But but it says, he will crush your head. An anointed seed sown intentionally will crush the head and the authority of the enemy in your life. So if you're looking at financial breakthrough, you're looking at family reconciliation, if you're looking at whatever needs to have, you need to have kingdom authority over it, the question we should ask is, what's the anointed seed he's asking me to sow? Is it time? Is it talent? Is it treasure? Is it, is it, a, is, is it an encouragement? What is it? What is the anointed seed that will crush the enemy's head? It also, though, says that the enemy will strike your heel. It means the sacrifice isn't always pleasant. Sacrifice can be painful. Sacrifice isn't always, like I said, happy, happy, joy, joy. There's that miracle in the Bible when Jesus asked the man with the, with the withered hand in the temple to stretch out the hand, his hand. And the miracle happens in the stretch. I like the idea of the miracle. I don't like the idea of the stretch. But what does he do? He says, man with a withered hand who should not be at the temple with a physical deformity like that, would you expose yourself to everybody around and the the vulnerability that you have? Would you show that to everybody and trust me enough? Oh, but God, couldn't you just do it like around the corner somewhere so nobody sees it. Every now and then, maybe we need to stretch to see the miracle happen and our ego dies along with it. And I believe that's going to be a word in this season for the kingdom, is egos will die. And they'll die a Rambo-style death. You know what I mean? I want my ego to kind of die, you know, rolling over in its sleep. Like, that's what I wanted to die. It's like, oh, you're not, you don't need me anymore. Okay, I'll go. Usually it doesn't go that way. There's usually a moment where God says, do you trust me more than your own control? And he says the miracle happens in the stretch. And when you go from this place and you plant something and you build and you grow, there will be a stretch and the miracle will happen. And you go, but... Isn't there a com- more comfortable way to do it? Most likely not. What I'm saying is there is a stretch. And the miracle happens in the stretch. And that's kind of sometimes we feel that pang of 
annoyance and pain because that's the enemy striking at our heel. But what happens? The anointed seed crushes the enemy's head. We have to make the choice between the comfort and our covenant. Let's go to the next slide over. So a seed was designed to be sown and sacrificed. A seed sown puts your breakthrough in motion and a seed sown has power to crush the enemy. Mary was good soil. Mary was good soil. You know, you can, you can buy pumpkin seeds for like $2,000, right? Better make some good pumpkin soup. $2,000. Now, I'm not a gardener, really in any way, shape or form. But if I went out and bought one of those $2,000 pumpkin seeds and and because I put value only on that seed, I'd go, well, it was, it's expensive. It's a lot of money. I'll just gather some dirt from around the corner here somewhere in the garden bed. And I'll put it in a pot and I'll put it in there and let's just believe, right? And, and the, the issue is, is that I'll put value only on the seed. But I could go to Bunnings and pick up a packet for, let's say, $10, $15, $20 even. And go and meet someone that is a soil specialist and say, how do we optimize growth for pumpkin seeds? And they could craft and curate this soil almost to say it's blessed and highly favored. And if you put a seed in there that you might not see its value yet, but in the right soil, it'll do better than something in bad soil. And every now and then we look at the seed that God's given us and go, I want someone else's seed. It, it looks like their seed's worth more than mine. When God's going, no, that's the seed I gave you. Just put it in the right soil. Because when you put it in the right soil, the Bible says, it says that his eyes will look to and fro of the earth, looking for hearts that are loyal to him. He just found a heart in Mary that was loyal to him. That would write a worship song in the middle of the unknown, not knowing the end result. And so there's seeds in us that we can diminish its value until we put it in God's soil that he said is blessed and highly favored. And when we put that seed in, an anointed seed, it has the power to crush the enemy's head. If we want to destroy the enemy's agenda over our life, over our family, over our bodies, over our future, all of it, so a seed. So an anointed seed. And it will be painful but it'll destroy the enemy's authority over your life. Let's go to the next slide. Sacrifice is scary. Sacrifice is scary. Giving something. It, you know, we, we, we look at our life and we go, we, give, we tithe. So let's just look at that principle. I'm going to give 10% away to the local faith community, and yet my 90% will make more. Like, if you put that on paper, people go, what? That doesn't make sense. But I learned a blessed 90 will give you more than 100, yeah. right? Yeah. But it's scary. It's scary. And it's okay. Like, I, I don't think we have to hyper-spiritualize this. We can actually be scared in the middle of our sacrifice and yet still be obedient. Let's go to the next slide. So I'm not really a National Geographic person either. But... <laughs> But I believe Jesus used nature. He talked about sparrows and clothing flowers and all that stuff. I just want to use somewhat of a parable style of using nature to, to show us the, the journey that we might be going on. And so the caterpillar, when it comes to the end of its, it, it chooses to sow itself into the soil of the cocoon. When it comes to the end of its juvenile stage, that's the literal language. When it comes to the end of its juvenile stage. So there's a caterpillar. If there was a caterpillar in a narrative, and if caterpillar saw a counselor, <laughs> this is a potential way that the caterpillar would be speaking and going, you know what? I feel like there's more in my life. I feel like I was designed for more. I don't know why, but I feel irritated by something on the inside. And I'll say this, frustration usually leads to your fulfillment. But it'll sit there and, it'll, and there's something more. I see something and I just can't get my head around it. I, I look around at my current state of life and go, surely there's more. Does that sound familiar to anybody? The human condition. <laughs> but here, here's John 12, 24. If it dies, 
You can live your whole life feeling frustrated and never in fulfillment. Always feeling like you were born for more, created for more. But until and unless you come to the end of your juvenile stage and actually trust God in the process, juvenile stage. Do you know what's called neoteny? N-E-O-T-E-N-Y. Like there's some science stuff that you can impress people at dinner with tonight as you gather them at your house and do pastoral care. Uh, it's, it, it's neoteny, N-E-O-T-E-N-Y. It's the reason why emus can't fly. Aren't you glad emus can't fly? Can you just imagine just walking through life like this? Can you imagine the car damage bills? Signing in your insurance? Emu droppings? Like, like what? And chiropractic issues, if, you know. But emus can't fly because their body keeps growing whilst their wings stop growing at their juvenile state. So there is a full-grown adult emu with juvenile wings. Now, in this case, I'm actually glad that's the way God designed them. But if we look at our own lives and we do a self-audit, are we full-grown adults with some juvenile traits? I was a youth pastor for long enough, and I love young people. A man's brain does not develop until they're 25, which is an excuse for a lot of stuff. Some wives in here going, well, I don't know. (laughs) But the fact is, is that in a juvenile state, again, you do youth ministry long enough, a a juvenile goes, I know what I know and I'm right. Don't argue with me. Don't tell me I'm wrong. I'm entitled and I want to be in control of my own narrative. What? Parts of that resonate in our own soul when God goes, I've got more for you and you know it, but you've got to give up some stuff. There's some juvenile traits that we carry even as older people. And even through the pandemic, it showed us where our juvenile state really was, including I I had to go through my own juvenile state journeys to say, I always thought that was going to happen that way. But then there's a stretch. He goes, yeah, but I need you to do it this way. And I go, yeah, but I don't want to do it that way. <laughs> you know, when the, first, when the pandemic first hit, I'll tell you this story, and it's a real story, and I hope it encourages somebody. But when the pandemic first hit, I will never forget when they shut the borders down, right? And I'm not really going to, I'm not that pandemic person. Let's always talk about the pandemic. But I've got to tell you the story. Is I'll never forget when I, where I was. I was on the phone. I'd just come back from Blenheim, New Zealand, and I was on my way to Perth that next weekend. And the borders shut down on the news, and I'm on the phone to the pastor in Perth. And I go, well, I guess we'll just postpone it for a month or two. Oh, my God. I'm such an optimist, you know what I mean? Like, it's only going to be, that we'll be over in like a couple of months. Let's push it to July, October. Can we just push, let's just put, put a pause on that, you know what I mean? And, and I'll never forget it. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me, because I'm having a bit of a freak out moment now. Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, give it eight weeks. As clear as day, eight weeks. Give it eight weeks. Do you know how hard I worked for eight weeks making stuff happen? Like, really hard for eight weeks. And every good idea, every Andrew Stone juvenile trait came out in eight weeks. I've got this idea, and I'm good at ideas. Let's be honest. I am good at ideas. And I kept doing it, and I kept, and nothing landed. Like, nothing. Like, I couldn't get one idea off the ground. Eight weeks pass, nearly to the day, and suddenly this influx of, calls and emails and everything came through and I felt I woke up that morning and I felt the Holy Spirit say see I told you eight weeks do you know I could have had a holiday for eight weeks (laughs) not stress not worry give myself over to the process and just trust but I didn't I'm not going to get those eight weeks back but I learned a great lesson is that when he says You're born for more, but you have to trust me. Trust him. Be willing to let go of your own ideas and mindsets and say, I'm sowing the seed intentionally to the process. So then this butterfly goes into this gooey state. It literally digests itself to the process, right? And, And in it, 
It's dark, it's unknown, but it's natural. Not every dark season you go through is the devil. Not every dark season. Now, there are some, because he's a liar and he, he's a murderer from the beginning. I get that. But there's other times where it's unknown and it's dark, just like a seed being put in the ground. We have to trust the process. Because in the process, there's something that gets unlocked. And it's called imaginal discs. You ready? Let's say that together. Imaginal discs. We'll say that one more time because I confused everybody on how to say that. <laughs> ready? On the count of three, we're going to say imaginal discs. So ready? One, two, three. Imaginal discs. One more time. Imaginal discs. That's another thing you can take and impress people at dinner tonight. Imaginal discs are this. When, they, when that caterpillar goes into that cocoon, it unlocks what they call imaginal discs. The imaginal discs are actual parts of the butterfly always that have been there in the caterpillar from the beginning. So the caterpillar has been roaming around the ground holding the butterfly inside of itself the whole time. The wings, the antennae, all of it. Every part of the butterfly is in the caterpillar. Now here's the question. If God can do that for a weird-looking furry thing that crawls on the ground, how much more would he do for you? How much more would he do when he gave us his image? But what happens first? We have to come to the end of our juvenile state. And so we'll fill the altar this morning to say, God, I'm giving that up. I don't want to think like that anymore. I'm not carrying that anymore because I don't want to walk into life with things that are inferior and holding me back from everything you've called me to. Imaginal discs can be unlocked. Let's go to the next slide. See, 1 Corinthians says this, What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed. We have to sometimes just say, God, I'm just putting the seed in the ground. But just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of something else. Verse 38, but God gives it a body. We don't sow sometimes our time, our talent, our treasure. We're not willing to give up our juvenile mindset sometimes or state because we want to know what it's going to look like right at the end. Mary gave herself to the story of redemption without knowing exactly what it was going to look like in the end. And yet her soul magnified. Her spirit rejoiced because of a seed. God gives it a body. We just have to be good stewards of seed. I don't need to compare your body to my body, your calling to my calling. I don't need to compare any of that because I sow the seed. God gives it a body. We don't sow seed sometimes because we want to make sure it's going to look like our neighbors over there or our friends over there or our sibling over there. And God goes, just sow the seed. I'll do the body work. Because comparison is a place where dreams go to die. So we just have to sow the seed. Let's go to the next slide. And then it has its breakout, right? It has its breakout moment. It's been in the cocoon. The imaginal discs have been awakened. You're feeling good about yourself because you're feeling this new season upon you. Who's ever been so excited at the beginning of a new season? Of course we are. We're ready. We're ready to go. You've been in a dark place. And if caterpillars could have conversations, there were times where the caterpillars told you, don't do it. Just remain one of us. Just be one of us. Don't change. What do you mean you're born for more? That's just a fantasy. You, there's, don't, you think there's more in you? Shut up. Like, just stay with us. Keep with the status quo. Don't, you know, don't challenge anything. Don't give the church that much. Don't be that kind. Don't encourage that person. Just stay with us. And you go, but I'm born for more. And so the same caterpillars now that have seen you go through the process that look painful, they go, oh, my gosh. What what did they do? 
And, then, and, and if they were talking, they'd look up at you as you're hanging there in your breakthrough going, doesn't look worth it. Doesn't look worth it. They look dead. They look dead. Oh, look, they're vulnerable too. See, the, when, when the butterfly has its breakthrough, it's the most vulnerable because it hangs lifeless for four hours, bringing a lot of attention to itself by birds that would like to eat it. And you know what it's waiting for? For the blood to fill its wings. What prophetic picture does that, does that show us? Is that sometimes in our biggest moment of breakthrough, we have to wait for the blood to fill our wings. The revelation of the finished work and resurrection of Jesus to say, only when the blood fills my wings and he's been working behind the scenes do we get to soar with fresh vision. Now, when we soar with fresh vision, we don't listen to the caterpillars that told us that we look dead, that it wasn't worth it. Because when we see something new, we're very rarely ever worried about what other people think of us. Let's go to the next slide. So sacrifice is selfless. Let's go to the next slide. I want to show you this. A caterpillar doesn't make more caterpillars. Caterpillars don't make more caterpillars. Caterpillars can't reproduce. Butterflies can. So the first, the, the mandates in, in Genesis were to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. We can be fruitful because we like looking good. Fruitfulness makes us look good. Who doesn't want to be fruitful? The only challenge is, is are we willing to get messy and break the fruitfulness to sow the seed in order to multiply? A caterpillar cannot be in multiplication unless it comes to the end of its juvenile self and becomes a butterfly. There are some of you in this room right now that are going, God, I, wanna, I don't want to just be fruitful. I want to multiply. I want to see growth. I want to see exponential growth. I want all that stuff. And he says, well, stop being a caterpillar. Because you cannot multiply at your current state. Can I have the band up, please? Here's the thought. That I can be fruitful under someone else's sacrifice. I was fruitful under my parents. I'm, I, as, a, as a pastor, I've been fruitful under other people's sacrifice to make my life better, to give opportunity. I've, seen, I've, I've been in the fruitfulness of someone else's sacrifice, but I have never been able to multiply on someone else's sacrifice. I can only multiply on my own sacrifice, intentionality. I don't, I'm not going to say to my senior pastor, I want to multiply you sacrifice. I'm not going to say to my dad, I want to multiply, you sacrifice. No, no, that's not how the principle works. It's got to be my seed. Why? Because if they sacrifice, they get a body according to what God's designed for them. But if I sacrifice, God brings a body and gives it sus, you know, substance to something he's designed for me. And so to be fruitful, to multiply and fill the earth means that we've got to come to a point at an altar just like this one where we would say, Holy Spirit, what, what is it in us that needs to die and to be sown into? And, and what's the seed that we say, God, I don't want to live in that juvenile mindset anymore, that way of thinking about money or serving or giving or encouraging. I, I, I need to give that and leave that at the altar to unlock the imaginal discs that you've got for me right from the beginning. If we go to the next slide, I'm going to close. Let's go to the next slide. The place of your transformation is not your destination. The cocoon, you don't stay in the cocoon and you don't only hang there for four hours. The place of your transformation is not your destination. But we have to go through the transformation in order to have a new destination. And in, as in Romans 12 would say, is that may you be living sacrifices and then be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Sacrifice precedes transformation. If we go to the final reflections. Is seeds were designed to be sacrificed. So are you intentionally looking for good soil? 
to multiply the God factor in your life, gifting, time, resources, words, relationships. Like, like where are you sowing seed? Do you know that the purest form of prophecy is to encourage somebody else in the Lord? It's just say, I'm with you, I'm for you. God's got a gift on your life. Where do you feel stuck like a caterpillar in God and you know God wants to unlock your imaginal discs, your true purpose? Let's keep reading. Is can you identify the different areas of your life where you're a caterpillar, a cocoon, a vulnerable butterfly or a soaring butterfly? If I was coaching you over the table and using this as, a, as, as the analogy, I'd say write four columns on a piece of paper and go, these are the areas of my life that I'm a caterpillar in. I've got to come to the end of my juvenile state. I've, I'm in a cocoon. I'm a vulnerable butterfly, a soaring butterfly. And you write down the areas of your life that you're one in each. And then go, which parts am I working on this year? And finally, sacrifice is saying to God, I trust you. Sometimes the simplest faith is saying yes before he finishes the question because it's not what, it's who. So would you stand up to your feet and let me pray for you? The worship team are going to play and we're going to sing a song in a moment, but here's your moment. If you close your eyes across this place, here is your moment to say, Holy Spirit, what is that one, two things that I can come to the altar today and say, I'm not leaving with that today? What is that mindset? What is that thought process? What is that, that, that issue? What is that healing that you need? Whatever, whatever it is, what is that blockage to say, Holy Spirit, I'm leaving different today? Today's a catalyst kind of moment, end of summer, October 2nd, 2022, where we can walk out saying, I'm ready to unlock the imaginal discs in my life. Come on, if that's you, you can just receive right now and say, Holy Spirit, I'm ready for my next season. I'm ready for this transformation. I'm ready for this transformation. Unlock it, God. Unlock the frustration. Unlock it. And unleash it. Holy Spirit, would you speak to us right now and identify the parts of our lives where we say, we're not walking out with that today. We're not walking out with that today. We're not walking out with that today. Father, we thank you for your revelation. We thank you, Lord God, that you can unlock and unleash the calls and the purposes that you have put in us from the very beginning when you knitted us together in our mother's womb. Lord, take those anointed seeds and may it crush the enemy's head and any agenda that he may have in our lives. As Mary would say, our soul magnifies you, our spirit rejoices because we will be called blessed from generation to generation. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray for every person's family and their finances. Release, Lord God, a fresh abundance, a purpose, a calling, and unlock us from our juvenile state. In Jesus' mighty name. Ooh.